the happiest investors are the ones who sit down to say, what do I really need? And can I build my business around it? Because that guy was not the happiest investor when he first came to us. But now he said, I filled up all my profit first accounts for the rest of the year. He sent me a picture in July and said, because of you know, like us having the money in the accounts and me knowing where I am. He sent me pictures of them, you know, like with sparklers and videos and stuff and being on vacation for a long time. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the CarrotCast podcast, where we help you dial in your online marketing and your mindset so you can build business of freedom and impact. I'm your host, Brady Winder. And today we have our friend David Richter on the show. He's an author of Profit First for Real Estate Investing, or Profit First for Real Estate Investors. Um, and he's going to share with us how to get off the real estate rat race, essentially, and stop living uh, deal to deal. And so why does this matter? I think it's obvious, but like I said, our mission at Carrot is to help you build a business freedom and impact. And you can't do that without um, without having your ducks in a row. And you can't do that with things like arbitrary goals. And so uh, David's going to share with us how what this Profit First concept means. So... Without further ado, David, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, Brady. Really excited to be here. I love what Carrot stands for and how they're helping a ton of people. So it's an honor to be here. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's good to have you on the show. Um, a funny little tidbit is uh, the connection, you know, through Profit First. Profit yep. First, uh, the so correct me if I'm wrong, but you uh, have adapted Profit First, a book written by Michael Michalowicz, um, mm-hmm. for real estate investors specifically. So you and him partnered up. Um, to basically have this concept for real estate specific, um, uh, Michael McCall- Mike McCallowitz also wrote Pumpkin Plan. Pumpkin yep. Plan that was a huge monumental book for Trevor, other host of the Carrotcast podcast and our CEO. Um, that was huge in his journey because it's all about um, finding your focus and going all in on one big thing instead of shiny hmm. object squirrel syndrome like all of us entrepreneurs struggle with. And so if you haven't checked that out, go look at the pumpkin plan and profit first. But anyways, let's dig into this, man. I know you're really excited to talk about it. I'm looking forward to the conversation. What is this um, What is this idea of profit first? Why does it matter to you? Sure. I've been in the real estate world for the last 10 years and It just kept coming up. I felt like that most entrepreneurs, business owners, especially real estate investors, they make money but feel broke. Like, Mm. where is all the money? Why don't I feel accomplished? Like, we're doing a ton of deals, but we're not actually, I don't actually feel successful. Like, I I see all the money come in, but then I see it all go back out. And I was working with a company like that. Back in the heyday, we were doing about 25 deals a month at one point. So 300 deals a year, you know, we're doing 25 deals a month, but spending like 26. It's like, (laughs) so I lived it. I saw it would go to masterminds, would hear people talk about it. Like, Hey, we're making money, but like we're, we're losing money or we don't even know. If we're losing money, like they don't, <laughs> they just have no idea what they're which making. Which ones, which ones more common? The, the, it's more common for people to not know at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then this, you know, and it's very common for people to just feel like, why am I doing this? You know, like, why do I keep doing all these deals if we're, if I don't feel the, the actual money in my account? That's what, that was one of the big catalysts for me to even walk down this road of, looking into profit first because through a series of events, I started working with another investor, helped him with his finances. And that was a huge turning point in his business. And I saw like, oh man, if more people just know what they make, what they spend and what they could keep, that would be life changing for them. Hmm. And that's where a mentor of mine at that time introduced me to the book profit first and said, you should read this if you're thinking about helping more investors. So that's where I read that book in like one sitting, took 10 pages of notes and said, what a great tool and a great book and concept for the entrepreneur, the real Mm. estate investor to be able to understand, digest without the normal, typical accounting books and stuff are just like, I'd rather shoot myself in the foot. (laughs) Just too much information. Exactly. Too much info or jargon that's just, you know, way out there speaking a different language. So that's where- Taking that concept and saying, I believe this could work for real estate investors. So that's where I started implementing and seeing it work because the whole concept, you asked what profit first is. I would say first, the mindset 
of Profit First is that we, we learn a bad formula going into business. We learn that it's sales minus expenses equals profit, meaning I make a sale, I pay everyone else and their mother, then hopefully at the end of the day, I have something in my pocket. And we're always looking for that someday in the future. We're always prioritizing our bills over ourselves. We're placing the emphasis on the wrong thing in our business, and it creates a bad habit, which we might already have too, like from our personal life. We might always be just be spending, spending, spending. Just because you become the business owner doesn't mean you know how to wear all the hats. And a lot of people think that way in business too with the sales minus expenses equals profit. They're always looking for maybe one day when I sell all the houses or one day when I sell this company, that's when I'll cash out and I'll be happy. Well, that someday mm. never comes. So the profit first formula and mindset is it's sales minus profit equals expenses, meaning I make a sale. I take my profit first off the table, then I have the expenses to build and grow the business from there. But Mm. I'm making sure I place the priority on a for-profit business, on the profitability and the health of the business and of the owner. Because so many owners don't pay themselves anything or don't pay themselves what they deserve or what they need or even what they need, then they feel why am I doing this? We're making money, but I'm not keeping any. You know, there's been super ultra successful people like in the upper seven figures to eight figures that have felt this way that I've had conversations with. And there's people that are doing two to 10 deals that feel this exact same way. Hmm. Why am I doing this? You know, I thought I was going to scale up. Everything would get better. But then they just are stuck, like you had mentioned at the beginning, in their rat race, living deal to deal, you know, paycheck to paycheck, month to month, and never getting anywhere. So that's the core of it is creating that habit. Then the other part of Profit First is the whole system and the practical side, which is what I believe separates it from like the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Richest Hmm. Man in Babylon, like some of these other books that a lot of real estate investors read because it puts a system behind it too. So that's the core of it is that mindset and trying to to transform our mindset from I have to live and sacrifice and just scrape by and just feel bad all the time to no, I need to take care of what's important first, take care of myself, take care of the the business health, and then make sure everything else is fitting in around it. So mm. it's just that huge mental shift. Yeah, I, I can relate to that, man. It's like, you know, when email came in, when we first started talking, I, I saw the book and I, you know, I said, profits first. I, I'm going to be honest. I was kind of skeptical. I was like, profits first. It's like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know yeah. if I love the ring to that or not just me personally. And I was like, sure. I, at first I thought it was all about like making money. I thought it was going to be how to make more money as a real estate investor. Obviously this far in the conversation, that's not the issue. It's, it's right. more, what do I do with the money? Um, and how do we use that money wisely? Yeah. So investors, people listening to this are probably going to trash me for even bringing up the name, but um, Dave Ramsey, uh, okay. a lot of investors just don't yeah. agree with what he teaches, but there are two things um, that I like that he teaches. And one is, um, and I think this relates to what you're saying, I'd be curious your thoughts, but one is living with an open hand. Money has to be able to come in and money has to go out. When you're trying yeah. to hold on to every little thing, you, that hand is not open to receive money. Correct. Um, the other thing I like that he teaches is give first. And so he has this this framework of basically give first in the sense of not giving as in uh, pay your employees, but giving as in out of a heart of gratitude and, and charity yeah. of yeah. like giving to others. And then, but the important part, like what you're talking about is save second and then your bills third. And right. so it's funny. I think it actually aligns with what you're saying. If the way that I look at it, at least it's yeah. give first, save second, um, pay your bills third. Otherwise at the end, you can't take care of other people if you're not take care of your, taking care of yourself. Right. And, so, and that's what a lot of people miss. And a lot yeah. of people miss that. It's the same thing that, the, you know, the cliche on the airplane, put your mask on first. It's like you have to in business make sure. And it's funny that you bring up Dave Ramsey's name because I'm definitely in that camp of like, I like, he helped me get started and have a yeah. personal finance, you know, and like help me, you know, not have a ton of debt in my personal life and, you know, make good choices on that side. But then when it comes to investing, it's like we, that's where we start parting ways a lot. Yeah, it's like, okay. Yeah. But... It's so funny that you brought him up and brought those two points up because there's a third part that he's made very popular that is the crux of the system of profit first, and it's the envelope method. Mm. It's the envelope method where he's made it popular, you know, like the little envelopes for your personal yep. finances and you put I've them done in it. different envelopes. Super inconvenient, yeah, exactly. but works. <laughs> exactly. 
Exactly. But it works and it helps you be very intentional with every single dollar that comes in. And that's the crux of the profit first system. So for everyone that's listening, I want to give you a practical steps here so you could, you can take this and run with it because I'm not trying to hide anything from you. Like I want you to be more profitable. And the big thing here that aligns with, you know, like what we were just talking about, the envelope method. So instead of having envelopes for your business, because no one wants like envelopes stuffed with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands (laughs) of dollars in them, you set up specific bank accounts in your business that are for the purpose of your business. And that's where we can now be intentional with every dollar. So Brady, Mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I'll go into some of those accounts that they could set up. You know, so that way yeah. they can have a head start here. The The first three, I talk about this in the book too. And I mean, if you are watching this, you'll get this because I mean, look at me glasses. I mean, I look like the finance guy, but <laughs> I love like the big epic sagas like Harry Potter, Star Wars, the ones that have like those three main heroes, right? Luke Han, Leia, always making sure good wins in the end, the light side of the force triumphs, you know, like the that that the story ends on a good note and that the triumphs over evil. Your business, the real estate investing business you're creating is your epic saga. It is the thing that you'll pass down. It is your legacy. It is your big movie. It's your Star Wars. You need three main heroes making sure you are profitable because that's what a winning business is. It's profitable. Profitable Mm. so it can give, (laughs) so it can accomplish the things that you want to accomplish with your business. That's what profit unlocks for you. So what are those first three accounts? The, The golden trio, the heroes of your business. Number one, a profit account. Go figure. Number two, an owner's comp or owner's pay. Then number three, an owner's tax account. Those three will save your butt and will make sure that you are focused on the right things in your business. And the profit difference between profit and owner's comp. Number one, profit is to make sure that you have the icing on the cake in the business to be able to do the things that you want to do. Like we suggest every quarter you take up to half of that money and do whatever the heck you want with it. You want to give it away. You want to go on a big trip. You want to buy something, you know, like what is use that money to feel like the business owner and getting the return on investment, Mm -hmm. trading the 40 hours working for someone else for the 80 hours working for yourself. So now you've got an account dedicated to that. Or if you have bad debt, that's like keeping you up at night, Use up to like 90% of it to knock that down. Knock that debt down. Use that profit account for one of those two main reasons. The owner's pay account, If you re- we talked about the real estate rat race and being in that and living deal to deal. The owner's comp or the owner's pay account is to make sure you can get out of your rat race. Making sure you're paying yourself your what you need on a consistent basis. So this would be an account that you draw from weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, and putting yourself on a consistent draw, salary, whatever it is that fits your situation, but making sure you're paying yourself from your business. Because if you're not paying yourself, you're probably making decisions out of fear and not from your purpose. You're Hmm. probably always running around like a chicken with your head cut off or always in that state of panic or anxiety. We need to take that away. So start paying yourself consistently with that account. Then the owner's tax is to make sure when tax time comes and you get that bill that you're not saying, oh, shoot, I need to do four more deals right now or not going to be able to pay this. So it's saving from every deal that comes in for the taxes if you pay taxes, if you don't have enough rentals to get it down to zero. So that's Mm -hmm. what that account is for. So those are the three main accounts to set up. You already have the operational expense account. That's already in your business, the one that you pay for all the expenses. So that one's the one where money goes out. It's already probably consuming your business. Like, so let's make sure we put some good guys in there. I do suggest the fourth account, the income account, where just deposits sit. So you set, you put, set this account up to have deposits go there. Then you're telling your money where to go from there. I also mm-hmm. call it the control account. Now you're controlling where it's coming in and sitting then you're pushing it to those different accounts and you get to tell how much goes where. So now, now it's not just a formula. Now it's not just Robert Kiyosaki telling you to pay yourself first. Now it's not just the richest man in Babylon saying a portion of all I have is mine to keep. Now you've got a system to back that up and put Mm -hmm. the money where it should go for the purpose of your business. A lot of the people in that we work with too set up like a giving account, just like you said. So that way it's one of the very first accounts that gets funded so they can give because that's their bigger mission in life is to, you know, give and to be able to do things for other people and for charity. So that's where 
you don't even have to have those fu- fundamental accounts, just those. You can set up what are specific for you too. Like, do you have a specific goal? Do you want to use your own money and start building your own fund to invest in properties? Or do you yeah. want to start a multifamily account because you want to do multifamily in the future? It's like the power of this is is incredible for the real estate investor because the real estate investor is already looking at their bank accounts and at their banks usually not a QuickBooks or a spreadsheet or something. So this is very visual too. I see money in an account. I feel better about that as the business owner. I can see it. I can see the profit growing or I can see OPEX is going to be okay. Like we have enough to cover what we're paying on a monthly basis and I'm still paying myself and Mm -hmm. I still have profit and I've still paid for the, you know, the taxes. That's the power of the system is being able to see that from the entrepreneur point of view and putting the profit mm. habit into practice. Yeah, absolutely. I think that alone, just having those multiple accounts, I've done that on a smaller scale for myself yeah. personally. And now that I've heard you explain, I'm like, I think I could probably double the number of accounts that I have set up and it still wouldn't be chaotic. I think it would actually help relieve some anxiety and like what money is where it's just, it's flying <laughs> yep. all over the place all the time. And that, that holding exactly. account. So I'm curious your thoughts on this. People could treat this like, you know, PTO when you have a W2 job and say, well, you know, I get X amount of PTO every year, every quarter, whatever. I'm just going to, it's going to roll over. It's going to roll over the next year. I'm going to take that 50%. I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to save up for a vacation. I'll I'll take a vacation. And then it's five years later and you're burnt out. Right. Do you recommend spending it every quarter? Can you save it sometimes? No, I... I, what I want you to do is take it out of the business account. And if you want to save it for a vacation or something bigger, like if you're, if you're slowly building that muscle over time mm-hmm. and like the profits start getting bigger and bigger, cause it's incredible. Once people start putting this in place, you know how much you can make in real estate. Like once people are focused on this, it can, that can escalate pretty quickly. So what do we tell people is, yeah, just take it out of the business, put it in your personal life and use it for what you, and if you have a spouse, talk with them, you know, like now you can have good conversations with your, with your significant other versus like, I don't know where the money's coming from. Now it's like, we've got this extra money. What do we want to do? Do we want to save it up? Do we want to buy this? Do we want to invest in something else? Like you can use it for whatever you want. I would just take it out of the business account. So that way yeah. you're not tempted to just use it for the business, you know, the day to day of the business. Right. You don't have the, we're going to Disneyland on the credit card. We're right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I love that. Um, one of the things that we had talked about before this podcast, I want to ask you about is, um, we see this happen all the time. Um, we see it in Facebook groups and forums. We, we yeah. see it when people come to care camp and masterminds and you know, people will say, I want to make a million dollars next year. I want to, 5x my revenue next year. I want to go from here to here. <clears throat> it's almost everyone. I think a lot of us are guilty yeah, of this. Totally. Um, what happens when you set arbitrary goals and what, I guess, what advice would you have to like, how can we better set goals that are not arbitrary, but still be, still be ambitious and be yeah, more effective? Totally. So I've got lots of thoughts around this. The first thought that comes to mind is from the book from Keith Cunningham. I love his books. He's got some great ones out there for just Mm. general business. One's called The Road Less Stupid. The other one's called The Ultimate (laughs) Blueprint for an Insanely Successful Business. And he says in there, if you scale cancer, the tumor grows. So if you have an unhealthy business and you try to do more of it and pour more in the top line, more is probably going to be falling out of the bottom. And if you're spending more than you're making and you try to make more, that doesn't cure the spending problem. Hmm. So that's where a lot of people think they can grow out of problems, but usually they're just creating bigger problems for themselves. They're not dealing with the true, deep-rooted issue and cause. So I would Hmm. say that's number one. Number two is it's a lot better. I'll I'll give you credit if you've taken the time to sit and think, why do I want a million next year? Or why do I want to do three to four X? Is it just because that sounds good? That it sounds like a stretch goal? You know, like this year you made a hundred and next year you want to make a million. You know, it's like, are do you have to 10 X the business? How are you going to do that without blowing up the business too? We had a client. Here's a story. We had a client that said when he came to us, did exactly that the year before. He was like, I want to go from like one deal a quarter to like two, two or three deals a month. 
And mm. so just started like marketing more, going out there hustling. Like his wife started working in the business too. Like they, that he said it was the most stressful year of my life. My wife also, when she started working, like started having seizures, like she was so stressed out, you know, like all the time because of all the activity going on. Then at the end of the year, he had the call with his accountant and they said, you lost $70,000 this year. Mm. So that's where don't just make an arbitrary goal because you've heard it from somewhere else because you, you know, that guy in the same town is doing this much or you go to a mastermind and they say this much or you hear someone on a podcast and they went from zero to a million in six months. It's like you have to do what works for you. You have to make sure that you sit down and say, what do I really need? Because with him, we had to unwind and say, what do you really need to live? And he said, honestly, only like four or five deals a year. I'm like, do we want to start there then? Like, so that way you can at least get into a safe space in your own business. Because he said the very first meeting with us, he said, I hate my business. I hate the fix and flip world because he was spinning his wheels, trying to do so much activity. But then at the end of the year was upside down. So that's where we've seen it in person so many times where we have to, one of the first meetings we have now with people, we call it the owner's comp meeting, the owner's compensation, like What do you really need from your business? That's a number that we walk people through of like, okay, how much is that in your personal life? Have you talked about, if you do have a spouse or significant other, have you talked to them about that number as well? Mm. Are you on the same page? So really having these deeper conversations up front that lead to, if you want to do a million dollars a year, this is why I want to do a million because then I'll be able to take 20% of that because I want to make $200,000 on my own. And I know I'm going to need to spend X amount in marketing. So that's like another 20%, you know, that I'm going to be spending on marketing this year. And then I want to hire a couple people. So like, if you have a plan, that's a lot different of saying, I want to do a million dollars next year. And here's why versus Mm -hmm. I want to do a million and you have no idea what those steps are or just even at a high level what that's going to mean. So that's there's my long winded answer of, you know, like when I hear people with those arbitrary goals and what they're saying. Dude, that it makes perfect sense. And it aligns 100 percent with what Trevor's been saying for years on this podcast and our webinars. It's is that you need to have you need to have a vision first and there needs to be a purpose in that vision like why right. do i want to make this much and not why does the business need to make this much but how much do i need or want to make in order to do the things that i want to do live the life that i want to live so you have to have that vision of what it looks like yeah um why are you doing it and then more importantly i think what you're starting to touch on is like can i even handle this mm-hmm. you know if i get to this point is it going <clears> to <throat> is it going to be the lifestyle i want but also, can I handle, do I want to handle a team of seven employees or do I want to handle this much revenue or this, you know, do I want to handle property management or fix and flips? Like, am I going to enjoy that lifestyle? Um, right. I think that's really powerful. I'm curious, you know, you, you've worked with a lot of investors. You've talked to a lot of investors. Is there, this might be a dumb question. Is there one particular type of investor who's the happiest, like the happiest investor? Is it the guy who's scaled it? you know, to the moon or is it the guy who's like, Oh, I actually need four deals a year or any the, common trait. The happiest investors, <laughs> which I'm, I'm completely biased because I see behind the scenes are the ones who sit down to say, what do I really need? And can I build my business around it? Because that guy that was going crazy was not the happiest investor when he first came to us. But now he told me in June, of this year, he's been with us for three years now. He said, I filled up all my profit first accounts for the rest of the year. So he had like seven months worth of like OPEX, owner's pay, profit, giving account with like a significant five figure sum. So like he said, I am there. And now he sent me that he, one of his big things is he wanted to take a month off with like his kids. And he's big on like the 18 summers book of like, you only have 18 summers with your kids. And, you know, Mm. so he's, he sent me a picture in July and said, because of, you know, like us having the money in the accounts and me knowing where I am, he sent me pictures of them, you know, like with sparklers and videos and stuff and being on vacation for a long time. And so he's one of the happiest clients I know of because he said, and he's doing more deals than four or five now a year, Mm -hmm. but he knows what he needs and he's now on the right track. But then we have other clients too that come to us and they're like, they're already doing a ton of deals, but they, you know, when they become the happiest, they become the happiest when they know what they make, what they spend and that they're keeping money. 
Mm. That's when I also see them because there's so many people that have that anxiety of, oh, shoot, I have no idea what I'm making, spending or Mm -hmm. keeping. You know, that that creates so much anxiety in their life when they finally are able to look at it, even if it's a bad number. They are the ones that say, at least I know and can take action now. You know before they were, yeah. Exactly. So we also see that. In, as far as happiness goes, it's the one that connects with their need number and focus on, is the business supporting what my my current stage of life? And then for like anxiety relief and stress relief, it's just knowing. It's having the control over what am I making, spending, and what do I keep? So those mm. would be the ones that we see the most in those types of clients. I like that. It wasn't the answer what it, that I was expecting, but it's better. It's not necessarily about how much you're making or, you know, comparing to other people. No. It's just that understanding. Exactly. Because we have right things. people making way more than that guy, but they're still yeah. just as happy because they've built it around their lifestyle, even while scaling up. So it just hmm. it depends on where you are. You had mentioned something earlier about uh, the wealth habit. Tell me about what what is the wealth habit? So the wealth habit is exactly what we're talking about here. It's getting into the habit. Every time a deal closes, you're transferring the money to those accounts. The first Golden Trio accounts first on a consistent basis. You're not skipping it. You're not forgetting about it. You're con- on a consistent basis. A deal closes or you get rental income coming in. And you transfer the money to those accounts first. That's the wealth habit because wealthy people of all walks of life make sure they don't spend every dollar that comes in. That Mm. is a middle class mindset of just using every single dollar for whatever they think is the next best thing. The next best marketing campaign, the next best software, the next best whatever. So the wealth habit is being disciplined to when a deal closes to control the money and say, these are the accounts first that gets funded, then I'm going to fund the operational expense. That's where we see too, Brady, like the transformation when we work with people because then they're like, oh, now I get it. Like now I see that and once they see the money start piling up, that's when they're like the lights are turning on of like, now I get it of no matter what happens in the future, a downturn, a crash, as long as I have this habit inside of me, I know that I could recover. I know that now I could be a good steward of my finances. So it's seeing that light bulb turn on, but it's like having that discipline, a deal closes, transfer the money, getting into that habit, whether it's weekly, monthly, you know, like however often you're closing a deal is how often I would say that you get into this habit of transferring the money to the accounts. Mm, I like that, man. What are some of the other tips you found most useful for investors? Some of the tactical things they can do to start? So here's a big one. This is one that has literally saved people thousands or tens of thousands and hence one, one, one very, very special case, several hundred thousand dollars. Hmm. It's an expense analysis, which I got to come up with a much better term for that because I know that will probably <laughs> turn people off. We'll get a hook. We'll work on it. It's right. Okay. Exactly. We got to get a better, better name for it. But this is a framework for going through what you're spending. So, that's that's the other thing too. Remember how I said one of the best reliefs for an investor was just knowing what you make, spend, and keep? Well, we can't unlock this one until we know what we're spending. So we can't unlock like this exercise until we know what we're spending out there. So get that in place first. Make sure you know what are you making, spending, keeping. Then run an expense analysis on what you're spending, which is really simple. Like Take the last two quarters. Print out what you've spent like on the lines and market with these three letters, P, R, or U. Is that expense, number one, profitable? Meaning it's bringing in more than what you're spending or it's saving you a ton of time, headache, or effort. So that would be number one thing to mark. Is that expense profitable? Number two, is it replaceable? Meaning, can I shut it off now and use it in the future? Do I, Can I replace it with something that's faster, easier, better, cheaper, or that brings me more profit? So that would be number two, market replaceable if it's replaceable. Number three, unnecessary. Pretty self-explanatory there. There's no reason why you should have this in your business anymore. It's a tool that you've stopped using. You know, it's something that a subscription, maybe a vendor, maybe something like that, or maybe employees too, you know, like to look at everything in the business. We, that's where we see a lot of people get tripped up to is that they have great team members and they're great people and they're loyal and they're, you know, they're hard driving and they're, they're great, 
But at the end of the day, they're not profitable or they're not saving time. And it's like, why are we carrying this dead weight here? Mm -hmm. So that's where take this and go through the expenses, but then also go through the people that are on the staff too. And if they're profitable, you should be taking them out to lunch. You should be sending them notes. Like these are your key players that you need on your team. But then number two is if they're replaceable or unnecessary, that's where you have to take a hard look. That's probably one of the hardest parts of what we do is like taking people through that. But the key here is that any dollar you save on an expense goes to your pocket. That's way different than bringing in $10,000 more a month on top line because top line does not translate to bottom line, but an expense cut or an expense that, you know, is repurposed can go to your bottom line. That's where one guy I interviewed on our podcast and he said he did this exercise and he cut out $50,000 a month. He was spending 110 and he went down to $60,000 a month in expenses because he went through this exercise. He said it took me two or three hours, but it was a huge return on investment. So I'm not guaranteeing that for everyone. That's the most extreme case I've seen. But even if you save, let's just say you save $1,000 a month, that's like giving yourself a $12,000 raise. Where can you put that money from here? So that's that would be one practical framework or tip that you could use in your business. And just take one or two hours a quarter to do this, and you could be saving yourself a whole lot of hurt and heartache for yourself and for the future and putting more money in your pocket. Hmm. I have I have two quick follow up questions. Uh, we'll probably wrap in the next few minutes. We're getting close yeah. in time, but um, uh, one question is how often? How often should you do this? So we have people at the minimum do it quarterly, at the mm-hmm. max monthly, and then I would not do it like once a year or even twice a year. I would do this on a quarterly basis at the least, and at the most once a month. You mm-hmm. know, if you want to be on top of this and to be able to you know, get cut as much as you can and put more in your pocket, but just to make sure too, that things haven't crept up on you. Or maybe there was an expense that, you know, like something got double billed or whatever. you like, you could catch those types of things too. Sometimes they're not insignificant. So that just helps you have a better handle. And then, you know, you know, everything that's going out the door then. So now, you know, and it gives you yeah. more peace of mind too. So it's like, do you want that once a month or once a quarter? Yeah, I like that. That makes sense. I've actually I've seen this ad for a tool that keeps popping up lately. It's like, hey, we'll help you cancel all these subscriptions you didn't know you yes. had. You know? True so, Bill and like a couple of those are yeah. the where they go in and they automatically will just cancel that stuff for you. Yeah. So we're talking about that on a bigger scale, but um I liked how you broke this down because initially when you said expense analysis, go through your bank account. I was just, this anxiety is creeping in. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to look at every single line item. Like that's the reason why I don't do my budget to the fullest extent. Um, But I like how you broke it down into PRU, profitable, uh, replaceable or unnecessary. It's, it's really simple. Now I am, uh, I'm recovering from this, but I'm a classic overcomplicator who likes to do more work than is necessary. Will there be any benefit or reason to uh, bucket the profitable items at all, like categorize them or <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. So you could see what is profitable in my business. What good decisions have I made and how do I keep making more of them? That's the whole point of the book, The Road Less Stupid. It teaches you how mm. to ask yourself good questions. That's a that's an answer that leads to a great question of okay, mm. these are all the profitable things. How did I make the decisions to to invest in these prof- profitable people or systems or processes? I think that's a great idea to be able to lump those things together because it helps you ask a better question. Honestly, same thing with profit first. If you know where your money's going into these different buckets, it helps you ask a better question of like, am I spending too much? Do I not have enough in profit? Am I not paying myself enough? It gives you yellow flags before red flags. So I, I like that suggestion of lump those profitable you know, categories together. So that way you can see in those items together. So you can see if there a pattern here of how I made these decisions for these things specifically, then you could do the same with the other two categories and say, why did Mm -hmm. I make this decision? What, what came about and why is this unnecessary now? Or why is this replaceable now? Yeah, absolutely. And I I think it's really important to do with your marketing too. And that's a, a mistake we see people make sure you see it as well. People make this with their marketing. They say, Oh, I spent so much market. I spent this much money in marketing and yeah, I got a few leads and maybe I closed a couple deals, but Oh my gosh, it just cost me so money. Instead of sitting down and looking at their cost per lead, their cost per deal, how much they can afford to spend, how much they should be spending to determine, should I spend less? Should I kill this marketing method or should I go all into this method? 
Um, yeah. It, so depending on when this podcast episode is coming out, we've had another recent one from Martin and Lynn where we talk about different marketing methods. Go listen to that one. Um, there's another really good one around uh, KPIs for real estate investors. Um, we did with, oh, I'm blanking on his name. I feel terrible. Anyways, uh, KPIs for real estate investors. Go listen to that episode where we talk about um, how to actually understand if those marketing methods are working for you and if they are profitable, like you're saying, David. Um, I really like that. But, you know, before we wrap up, anything else, um, anything else tactical or that you feel people should really know as far as implementing yeah. this profit first? So if you've listened to this, and you're like, that sounds like a lot of work, whatever. Number one, <laughs> it might not be time for you. But number one, I would say at least set up one account, call it profit, and transfer 1%. Can you get into the habit as fast as possible? Mm. Can you take, can, so start where you can. So if you're like, this was overwhelming, I can't do it, help me. It's like, <laughs> can we start with one account, call it profit? So that would be one tip. Second tip is if you are a fix and flipper or a landlord and you take money from other sources, like other people besides self-funding all the time, I would open up an OPM account, other people's money. So that way you separate out what is my money versus what other people's money for the, like the rehabs or for the, the jobs that I have going on. So that way you don't have that false sense of security that I've got a ton of money in my bank accounts, but it's not mm -hmm. all yours. So I would set up a different account for other people's money when they send it to you. So that way you're not mixing your operational money and your profit and all that and what you're paying yourself versus what other people are giving you for projects specifically. Yes. I love it. our producer over here. Braden is, sh is shaking his head in agreement. Like, yes, we have these conversations about when you're getting deposits from people for gigs and, you know, video photo gigs, like anything freelancers, uh, landlords, it's like the anxiety of holding on to other people's money and not having it organized. It's like, yeah. I know what that feels like. And it's, it's not good. So just right. the, the relief I could think of from separating that and saying, okay, we're not going to touch it. Like it's critical. Yeah, critical. Exactly. Awesome. Well, we got to wrap it up here. Um, before I do a little recap, where can people find you and connect with you? Sure. So there's the one-stop shop, simplecfo.com. Simplecfo.com, that's where you can find our podcast, The Book 2, Profit First for Real Estate Investing. It's on Amazon, but it's also there. Then if you want to book a call, there's a book a call button. It's a no obligation call whatsoever. We just want to connect you with someone in the real estate space. If that's us, great. If it's not us and you need another financial person on the team, we have those contacts. We just want to make sure you have the profitability. You get off your real estate rat race. So simplecfo.com. I love that. Thank you, David. Thanks for sharing that. Um, for sure. Some of the things that stuck out to me is just, you know, simply having those accounts, those three to five accounts. And like you said, if that sounds overwhelming, start with one, 1% 1 to one separate account for profits. Um, and then doing the expense analysis. I've accepted the challenge mentally of like, I'm going to help you come up with a better name. I'll email it to you. <laughs> okay, good. Please we'll get do. something like really sexy. That's like, there oh, I have to do that. So I'll yeah. be working on that. Awesome. Um, but do an expense analysis um, at least quarterly. Um, not once a year. And then, oh man, when it comes to arbitrary goals, like please help us in yeah. the fight, join the fight against arbitrary goal setting and have a vision and purpose for your business. Yeah. Um, Trevor's done lots of uh, podcast episodes on this. We'll link a couple up in the show notes, um, but have a vision for your business. If you want to see some of the things that Carrot is doing and what drives us, you know, We've had a lot of success as a business. We could have hit the brakes years ago. Trevor could have said, oh, we've grown enough. Um, why we keep moving forward and why we're still doing this podcast and why we help people. Uh, go to carrot.com slash impact and you can see where we choose to give our money and hopefully you find them inspiring. Um, if you got value out of this and if you have an idea where you give, uh, if you've gotten some cool ideas to where you want to give your money or um, something really stuck out in this conversation to you, email me, brady at carrot.com. And we'll talk about it. We'll bring it up on the next podcast episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, that being said, thank you so much, David, for coming on. It's been, a, it's been a great conversation, man. Well, thanks for having me here. And just, I love getting this message out there. Please don't live deal to deal. Take some practical steps and do this. That would be the best thing that you could do from this podcast. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you later.